Hi, this is Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois, host of Sharper Iron here on KFUO. Thanks for being a regular podcast listener of the program. We are starting a new series on Sharper Iron that will take us all the way to right before Christmas. And that series is called Nothing But Christ Crucified. In this series, we will be reading the epistle of 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've ever been in a congregation where groups of people don't always get along, where there are factions, if you've ever been in a congregation that has had questions about Christian doctrine and practice, what do we believe? How should we live? And let's just be honest, who hasn't been a part of that kind of congregation? Well, then St. Paul's words to the church in Corinth will resonate with you. The Apostle Paul first proclaimed the gospel in Corinth during his second missionary journey. It's described in Acts chapter 18. And the Lord brought forth the fruit of a Christian congregation there in Corinth. That congregation was enriched by God's gifts in abundant ways. But as is always the case when groups of sinners get together, division and doubt attacked the Corinthian Christians. So they wrote to St. Paul with questions about the Christian life and faith. That correspondence from the congregation itself, combined with other reports that St. Paul had received about a variety of troubles in Corinth, all of that led to this letter that we call 1 Corinthians. And yet for all of the issues that St. Paul addresses within this letter, he writes to these Christians as such. He addresses them as saints, his brothers in the faith, those beloved by God. Through it all, St. Paul aims to to keep the Corinthians' focus squarely upon the power and wisdom of God for their salvation and for ours, Christ crucified. Join us on Sharper Iron to study 1 Corinthians so that together we might learn to know and to love Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, November 17th, we are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. In today's text, St. Paul speaks once again to the divisions that are present in the church in Corinth, and he begins to teach them how to properly consider the servants whom God sends to plant and water the gospel message by which God himself grows and builds his church. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Mike Newman. Pastor Newman serves as president of the Texas District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. President Newman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Pastor Apple, it is always a pleasure. Good to be with you. So as we get started today, President Newman, give us some context. What should we know about this epistle, what Paul's been saying leading up to chapter 3? We know what's so fascinating about 1 Corinthians is that it's so much like today, especially (laughs) the culture we talk about in the United States. It's amazing how God's Word just endures and always speaks into our lives. So I'm sure you've touched on it, but the city of Corinth, such a cosmopolitan city, a melting pot of various ethnicities and religions and backgrounds. And it's pretty amazing uh, that the Apostle Paul started a church here. You know, some commentators say that it wasn't just because of the trade route, uh, but really it was a strategic place where people from all nations gathered. And if he brought the gospel there, and as people believed in him, they would also be dispersed to other places around the world. And so a strategic place to get the message of the gospel out to the world. Pretty remarkable. But there were huge challenges there. And this letter, of course, is a response to some questions and difficulties going on right there at the Christian church in Corinth. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, you, you mentioned that there were a bunch of nations gathered there in Corinth. We talked about in the previous episode that the letter 1 Corinthians shows up within the life of the church in the lectionary. If you use the three-year lectionary, you hear the letter of 1 Corinthians, most of it, over the course of the three years during the season of Epiphany. And so I've, it, that's just been something that, since that was mentioned to me, I've been reflecting on. And the fact that you have all nations there in Corinth, I think that's another thing that makes this a fitting epistle for the season of Epiphany. You think about the gospel being revealed to the nations, that was happening there in Corinth. That's a great insight. Yeah, and it's, again, Epiphany season is so wonderful for understanding the ministry of Jesus, the life of Jesus, and then what it is to be a follower. And as the nations, of course, were drawn to him, here we have in the Epiphany season a remarkable epistle that teaches the nations what it means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Yeah, so with, with some of those things in mind, then, we're, we're doing, we've got chapter 3 here today, and just what are some of the things that Paul's mentioned already, uh, themes that he's brought up that'll come back into play here in chapter 3? You know, the big thing is this contrast of the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men, which really is foolishness, and uh, making sure that people understand where they stand in terms of uh, really submitting to and understanding God's will, uh, the great gospel given to them. He, you know, Paul is very gentle with them. He affirms them, but he also then uh, is bringing up the issue of divisions in the church. You know, he right away he raised that challenge to folks, and he was going to address some hard issues. It's something. Here's Pastor Paul. Instead of just moving to the questions they had, he looks at a primary need for the church in order to bear faithful witness to the world. So he brought that up as well. And, you know, he, I, I think his conversation reflects on all the philosophy, the ideas, the spirituality that saturated the culture at Corinth as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, you see the, the mark of a faithful pastor in Paul here, as he certainly responds to the questions and the reports that he's been getting from the Church, but does so in a way that, again, faithfully addresses them, but doesn't it has that theological understanding, the foundation to it, not just saying, here's how to fix it, and yeah, here's how to fix it, now do it, but here's the foundation. And it keeps coming back to Christ crucified so far, and he's going to keep building on that foundation as we jump into chapter 3 here. That's for sure. That's a key word, foundation. And he just wraps this message with grace. You're right, he's so pastoral. Yeah, all right. So First Corinthians chapter 3, that's our text for today. Paul writes, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, 
The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. That's our text for today. That's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 23. President Newman, as you said, we're picking up with some language that we heard in chapter 2, this language of being spiritual people, but Paul says, you brothers, you brother Corinthians, you were not spiritual people. I couldn't address you like that. I had to address you in a different way. Uh, what's he saying here at the opening part of our chapter? Yeah, you know, he's really saying that they think they're spiritual, and and in that that culture, in that city, they felt very much, kind of like we do in the U.S., so there's a lot of spirituality. But I think in, in Corinth, with all the temples and all the different religious actions, uh, they could have had some hubris about their high spirituality, but Paul brings them down to earth and addresses them as fleshly, people of the flesh, and uh, letting them know that their actions are, are really not spiritual at all. True spirituality is not what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So talk, talk about what he—I mean, when he calls them people of the flesh and having to feed them with milk rather than solid food, um, talk about what he means there and, and what's the indicator that they are still of the flesh, as he says. Yeah, fleshly meaning, of course, walking according to their own ways, and later on he says that too, you know, you're being merely human, or you're walking according to man. So they're looking at their desires, their preferences, their feelings— things they want the way they want things to be, and their arguments about who, what allegiance they have. And, and it sounds like uh, some of them are saying, I know more because I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. And so he says, you know, you're living totally in the flesh, in your sinful flesh, in your fallen flesh. The foundation being your own knowledge, your own conjecture, your own pride instead of really humbling yourself repentantly before Christ and understanding what it really means to be spiritual. So he's pointing out uh, their sinfulness, and he, he uses uh, the word for uh, power or ability. You know, dunamao, it's a verb, that's kind of where we get dynamite from, you know, that word dynamite. But over and over again, he highlights that you got, you're not able, you know, you don't have the strength. So it's a pretty huge indictment and uh, an opening to this chapter that would bring people to their knees, stir their consciences, and let them know that the law is speaking to them, putting its finger on where they are erring. Yeah, and with that language of, of being able or being powerful, I mean, I, there's maybe an echo there of what he's already proclaimed in chapters one and two about where the power, or where the ability would actually lie. It's, a, it's, again, not found in ourselves. It's not found in any particular individual other than Christ and particularly him crucified. So with this language of not being able or powerful to do something, it, it's, it is a rebuke of the, where they're trying to find the power to do things but also a call back to where they will find power, ability to do things, and that's going to only be in Christ and cruci yeah. Him crucified. It really is woven so beautifully. You see these words continue to pop up, and as you said at the beginning, these themes that reinforce the message, reinforce the message, bring it forward, and throughout the letter, he just keeps digging deeper to steer them to faithfulness and to understanding of they live by grace alone, not by their works. Yeah. Now, as, as he identifies this uh, fleshly attitude among them, he particularly brings up the jealousy and strife in verse 3. And, you know, I think when I think of the letters to Corinth, I think of problem congregations. But that's really not the point. Strife and jealousy are something that can, can crop up in any congregation, no matter how healthy it may seem at the time. These are always going to be temptations of the devil. Talk about these these two temptations to strife and jealousy and why they are so dangerous to the Christian church. It really is a, an important message for all of us. It, it's more of a, how does the church bear witness and, and really clarifies what is most important for the church today. I'm really astounded that out of all the troubles that are going on in Corinth, and some just really, really concerning with sexual immorality, disorder in worship, and we really run into some sticky situations. Yeah. 
in the church in Corinth, what he does is he highlights what he sees based on the scriptures, based on his being an apostle, uh, as the most important issue for the church. And this strife and jealousy militate against that. You know, Jesus said that people, the world will know we're his disciples if we love each other. And in John 17, his high priestly prayer, he prayed for the church to be one. And Paul is saying, let's, let's get away from your questions just for a bit, because I'm sure there was some debating and some people wanted to be right about their side of the issue. And maybe they were right. Maybe there were some people who were right. But what he was saying is there's a deeper spiritual issue. And it really is the way you love one another, the way you conduct yourselves with one another. Jealousy and strife, even if you're right, raising your voice and causing difficulty is not what the Christian church does. And it's not how it bears witness to the world. You know, the first priority of the church is not to enforce morality or to become legalistic in those things that are neither combated commanded or forbidden, or to be mean about the things that are definitely commanded. But it is really to shine forth uh, God's love in Christ Jesus. And gosh, we could all lose that. You know, it can become really secondary to uh, wisdom and learning, our organization. Uh, we're a very intellectual church. We really do we're very thankful and glad for pure doctrine and the right interpretations of the scriptures. But wow, the love of Christ supersedes all those things. And of course, you know, this is a little hint, indirect hint to what we see later in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as well. Hey, the calling really is love, the love of Christ and loving one another. And he's setting that tone and foundation for them as they deal with their issues. Well, and thinking about where he's been already in chapters one and two, especially the way chapter two ended, he's he's told them, we have the mind of Christ. And in chapter one, he called them to be united in the same mind and same judgment, and all of that under the name of the Lord Jesus. So all these questions that they have and the issues that they're facing in terms of, of both doctrine and practice, none of them will be resolved if they try to approach this on their own power. It can only happen under the mind of Christ, which is is only revealed through the Holy Spirit as he's proclaimed in the Word, and in that place where, where we find most scandalous, Christ crucified particularly, that's where the unity has to be found. And, and in that mind of Christ, then, there is both true doctrine and true practice and true love for each other. Those, those two things are not separate, but go hand in hand as we rejoice in the true doctrine, we rejoice to be members one of another in that true doctrine. And so the love for each other goes hand in hand. And these divisions then, which is the issue he is bringing up here, those divisions have no place because Christ isn't divided. He's He is one. And, and that's where Paul, I think, is going to start to draw out, again, with that firm foundation and the basic in mind, he is going to start to apply it to a particular situation in Corinth as this chapter goes on. That's for sure. And I think you make a great point because Loving one another, as Jesus articulated in the Gospels, of course, is true doctrine. It's, it's part of our doctrine, right? Our teaching. We can't say, well, that's just ancillary or that's an either-or type of thing. Uh, no, that's, that's part of it. And that does then create the context for lifting up all true doctrine and practice exactly. So it's a high integrity, the whole Gospel for God's people. So as he begins then to, to talk about this strife and jealousy, it sounds like verse 4 then comes back to the issue he brought up previously in chapter 1. What, what kind of strife and jealousy is there in Corinth that he's addressing? Yeah, they were picking sides, weren't they? They were aligning themselves. Later on in this chapter, he brings Peter into the picture too, which is interesting. But yeah, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and I'm with this guy. Uh, he talks about some say, I follow Christ. So they were just picking sides. And wow, we're good at that, aren't we? It's another sinful default we have. We tend to be, we're tribal people. We, we thrive on division. And Paul is speaking something, the counterintuitive gospel, and really putting it in proper 
context when it comes to God's plan and grace and who we really are. So yeah, they want to follow folks. It's interesting, they mentioned Apollos, and we see in Acts chapter 18, of course, a little bit of the history of what happened in Corinth. But you know, it makes me wonder, and this we could get off into this rabbit hole, this beaten path here, but with the mention of milk and not solid food and the connection to the Hebrews and you wonder about Apollos and the author of Hebrews. It's kind of fun to muse. Where did that di- you know, language come from? From Paul or did Apollos bring it up? And it's pretty fun. You know, well, we did, we just studied Hebrews here on, on Sharper Iron after, right before 1 Corinthians. And now that you mention it, you know, that language of milk, solid food does come up in Hebrews and Apollos is sometimes floated as an author of that. So is Paul, of course. That 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 is a, that would be an interesting rabbit hole to to go down. It it is striking though, without without maybe going down that rabbit hole. But the fact that he does specifically mention just Paul and Apollos here, Cephas does come up toward the end of the chapter, as you said, and he was a part of the list in chapter one as well. It, it does seem that Paul and Apollos are the two, and it's it's just hard to know without seeing it. But just the way that Paul writes here, it does seem that Paul and Apollos are the two primary ones that have the the parties that the other ones are a little maybe more auxiliary. I, I don't know. That might be reading too much into it. Well, I think you're right. It makes sense too because Paul, of course, was the first contact the people had, and you know he was the founding pastor, and everyone loved the founding pastor. Then Apollos went later to clarify things, to help uh, stand up for the uh, Jesus Christ as the Messiah, defend the church, and I'm sure there were some new members who didn't remember Paul, and they loved Apollos, and you know, it happens today. I could see that right. happening very easily in Corinth. That's right, yeah, and, and and Apollos is the one, it does seem, of the two that has maybe the, the more flourish to his style. I, I, I picture him in the pulpit with a little bit more flair than Paul might have had, just not that Paul didn't have that, but just the way that Paul talks about his ministry there and the way we read about Apollos in, in the book of Acts, it does seem that those two styles perhaps were a little more contrasting, perhaps leading to some of this division that he's talking about here. I think so. And another good lesson to learn, you know, the scriptures teach us on so many levels, but here, what a great way to address church members who had beloved pastors in their congregations, and then they welcome a new pastor and this really just helps, I think, us all understand that the point, as you know, verse 5 says, is, well, these are all servants, and the Lord gives the servants. We live in gratitude, but the focus is the gospel. The focus is the Lord of the church. Yeah, so, so take us deeper into verse 5, because that is where he starts to answer the issue that he brought up back in chapter 1 that comes up again, as he now says, okay, you want to have this conversation about these people you're following? Let's talk about who they really are. Now take us into that section. Yeah, this is great, because as Paul unfolds this, again, his point is not to engage in an argument. And I just, this is a master stroke of Paul and a good teaching for all of us. It's easy to be drawn into the vortex of the arguments and echo the narrative of the arguers. What Paul does here is transcend the argument to set the tone and the context and again, the foundation of God's grace and Jesus as Lord of the church. So again, he takes Apollos and himself. He's very self-effacing here again. And he calls him and Apollo servants. And it says here, as the Lord assigned to each. And the word is uh, a grace word. It says the Lord gave, you know. So these are, you know, Paul and Apollos are gifts the Lord gave for the purpose of the church. And their roles were unique. Planting, as Paul said in verse 6, Apollos watering. But again, the bottom line, the foundation is God is the one who gave the growth. And he underscores that in verse 7, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. And in verse 8, he equates the two as really laborers receiving wages according to their labor. And I love in verse 9 how he, he then pours it back into, this is all God's doing. This is all God's doing. You are God's field. You are God's building. He creates this picture language, and it's a farm field, so people understood that who were from more agricultural settings. 
he does city and country here, you know? He's got, That's right. yeah. you know, God's, if you're God's field, what does a field do? A field doesn't get up in the morning, water itself, plant itself, and tend itself, you know? this is You guys are a farm, and God is the one doing all of this, and same with a building. It's a beautiful thing, but a building doesn't build itself. The Lord is the one who created all of it, and we are on the receiving end of his grace. We are his servants, and that's the posture we have in our faith toward one another. Yeah, I, I'm glad you, you brought out that word that he assigned, as it's translated in the ESV, or that's just simply he gave, that this is a, a gospel passage, that this is gift from the Lord. And I, I think that's something from this text that can apply both to pastors and congregations. So just speaking as a pastor... This has been a very comforting text for me during my ministry because I have been in seasons both of planting, of watering, and I know he doesn't mention this particularly, but also of, of harvesting. I remember when I first started as a pastor, just newly ordained, a number of people before me had planted and watered, and we had less than six months into my my pastoral ministry, we had a confirmation. I think we confirmed six adults and baptized six more. You know, and it and that wasn't because of me. I was simply the the servant who was there at the time who got to experience that harvesting. And and having that early in my ministry then was a reminder later in ministry at other times where I was doing a lot of planting, watering, maybe some tilling and weeding, and I wasn't seeing the harvest all the time. A reminder that, hey, you're just the servant. God's the one who's going to give the growth when and where he he wills. Yeah, and this is really encouraging for pastors and people in whatever stage or season they are in the church. As you said, sometimes you aren't seeing the growth. You don't see the young people or the big Sunday school or the big VBS like we had years ago. But we don't need to be discouraged because God is the one taking care of his church. And there are different seasons. We may be in a planting and watering season. And we need to wait, and someone else will come and reap the harvest. But we know God's Word doesn't return empty, and it does accomplish that for which it is sent. And so it is really not only tremendous comfort for people in various seasons of life, but it really shows, again, who God is, that He is the faithful farmer. He is the one tending the field. It's going to be okay. The church is going to be okay. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is God's building. And whether there's uh, shortages of supplies or supply chain issues like we had during COVID, whatever it may be, it may feel like that for now. Or you may be the one who gets to cut the ribbon and celebrate this great building. But through all of it, God is faithful. He's doing his good work of salvation. We can take heart in that and trust him always. Right. And so then, as, as you said, it, it becomes an encouragement not only to the pastors, but also to the, the congregations, that my, my congregation may not be in that season of, of growth, at least the visible growth that we can, we can see. I know during the, the days of COVID, there was not growth in terms of numbers, but I, I saw growth in other ways. The Lord, the Lord allowed me to see growth in other ways. So, but again, it's a, a comfort to all of us, pastor or hearer, to know that God is the one doing this, so that, you know, when, when, my, when I as a pastor maybe don't do as good of a job as I think I should, to know that God is, is the one at work, or when I as a hearer don't, maybe I don't like my pastor as much, I like the old one better. Well, the Lord is the one who assigned, and I think about the way we, we speak about and think about the call, the Lord is the one who places his servants in the church, and that includes pastors and hearers, and to know that that is such a comfort that this is God's gift, and He can always give better than I can arrange. And this is that's really the foundation of living a life of repentance and gratitude and trust versus taking sides and entering into strife, jealousy, and causing trouble because it's just not going the way you want it to go at this time and in this season. And through the ages, you know, the same thing is true of the Holy Christian Church through the ages, the ebb and flow and the the challenging times and the times of growth, it always, it just teaches us that God is faithful and we don't have to uh, take up our own, you know, fight with the weapons of the world or take up our own strategies here. Paul, with the people in Corinth and with us, uh, he's saying, you know, there's something bigger going on. Live in trust, show Christ's love, and know that it may not be going your way all the time, but the Lord is on his throne, he's prevailing, and the, 
Jesus Christ died and is risen from the dead. He lives and we can trust him. And that's, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, right? When it yep. gets to that chapter, it's the exclamation point of this is all founded on the, the Savior who died and rose again. We don't have to worry. That's right. That's right. We can simply live as servants, and that is a joyful thing to let the Lord be the Lord, and I get to be the servant. And that that's fantastic, because he does a great job at being Lord, and so I can I can let him do that with, with faith in him. We're going to keep talking about this text more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to President Mike Newman this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, November 17th. We're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 23 with Pastor Mike Newman. He is president of the Texas District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. President Newman, prior to the break, we were looking at the picture language that Paul uses in verses 5 to 9. He uses the image that Jesus uses often in his parables of the Word of God being the seed that is planted and watered. God gives a growth as a harvest. He's even said that the church is God's field, but then in that same verse, verse 9, he switches pictures that he really picks up for the rest of the text with God's building. So take us into that image that, again, is mentioned in verse 9, but then he develops in verses 10 and following. Don't you just marvel at Paul's writing and his thought process? I would love to get inside his brain. He jumps from one image to another image to another image, and I I have to believe that it had to do with his intimate knowledge of the church. It's like a pastor with a congregation seeing the faces of the people and understanding where he can make direct application, how they'll understand it. And I think that's what makes him move through this. And in verse 10, he does move back to the building motif, and he calls himself a wise architect, right? The master builder in Greek, it's really architectone. I think that's so fun to see that. A wise architect. And according to the grace God gave him, he laid this foundation. And he uses this word foundation. It's a form of the verb tithemi. And we get our word theme from that. You know, the basis, the foundation. What's the theme for our life and faith? It really helps us understand what he's saying here. And uh, let each one take care then how he builds upon that foundation. In other words, what is the theme for your life as a follower of Christ? What is your theme for life in the community of Christ as well? Be very careful about this. And it's just a great way to get people focusing on, and and you, you and I can do it too, on what is our operating system? What's our theme in life? Do I approach each day angry that I don't have enough time or hassled because of the lines I face or the people who get in my way or worry about my financial situation or an illness or despair and hopelessness because of the headlines or hurt in my life. What is my theme? What is my foundation? Or is it the unshakable hope of Jesus Christ, the fact that he promises to be with me, that he has washed my sins away, and in fact, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and he truly is Lord of all. And even though things look like they're falling apart, we have a Savior who holds all things together. Yeah, this this language of the foundation is so important. And to, to keep coming back to it is is very important as well. As much as Paul does, I think, criticize them, 
earlier in this chapter that he was only able to give them the milk and not the solid food, he still, I think, is, is joyful to have given them the milk. He still is joyful to come back to this foundation, Christ and him crucified over and over again. Because if you lose that foundation, then you've got nothing. And it doesn't matter what you're building if you're not building on that foundation. Uh, that brings to my mind the way that uh, Martin Luther talks. I, I think it's in the preface to one of his catechisms, how he talks about those who want to be doctors of the church, but they they just forget the catechism, and how he's glad just to sit there and, and learn and over and over again the commandments, the creed, and the Lord's Prayer. As Because when you've got that foundation, that does make all the difference for the way that you then build. You know, if, if that's what you're starting the day with, you're going to build on the right thing, rather than building maybe something that looks beautiful, but it's going to fall because it doesn't have the foundation. That's right. Everything you give your attention to will shape who you are in life. And if you're giving attention to that wonderful foundation, then that flows from who you are. And, you know, verse 11, I think, is just so profound. And talk about, we could spend an hour talking about, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the grace of God, the gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ, are all in all, the foundation for all, who we are and what we do, our strength, our ability, uh, no boasting in ourselves, but you know, boasting in Him alone. I was talking with a gentleman the other day who was, uh, in his younger days, a meth addict. And, oh boy, he went through difficult times in his teens and early 20s. And he was mad at God and, you know, up to the point of cursing God and defying God. And he told me there was a point in his life in his 20s when suddenly, through as he was reading the Word and hearing the Gospel, it just gripped him that without Jesus, there was absolute nothingness. It wasn't as if he could dismiss God and go on his merry way. He, every synapse of his brain, every cell, every part of his existence depended on that foundation that was laid, Jesus Christ. And he, he said he just experienced this total sense of emptiness, and it created absolute dread and realization that without God, he's nothing. And, and that's what Paul really is communicating here. In verse 11, he is the foundation, the theme, the only one, and there is no viable option. All other options are really a lie in emptiness. Yeah, and I think, you know, thanks be to God for so many of us as who are in the Christian church today that we don't have a memory like that, that, that our memory is one in which the foundation was given to us in baptism when we were infants, and we don't have a... a physical recollection of, of a time when that foundation wasn't there. But the danger that does exist for us in, in, that, in that gift is that we would, we would take it for granted and not realize that without that foundation, there is nothing. And so, I mean, wow, what a, what a, what a powerful account then to hear that firsthand so that, that we who've had that foundation wouldn't take it for granted, but would rather build upon it and I think then also, you know, share share it with great joy. Like, look look at what we have. This is the best thing ever. And apart from it, you don't have anything. Just to, again, that yeah, that it is a foundational verse, very much so. Yeah, and so true, you know, then to build upon that. And that's really the gift we've been given, the privilege we've been given to steward, right? How are we building? And that's what Paul gets into when he talks about what are you building on the foundation with? You know, is it gold or all the way down to straw? This you know meaningless, the easily burned up and disclosed on uh, that last day. You know, uh, the work we've done. Paul is really calling the people here in Corinth to serious accountability hmm. about their actions. What are you doing? How are you building on this foundation? And he's letting them know that it's pretty shoddy work if they're just veering off into this jealousy and strife and arguments and divisions and personal interest, this self-service, he says, this is serious stuff and it's going to be revealed. You may be able to hide it now. You may be able to cover it up, even lie to me about it, you know, Paul is saying. But, you know, we're dealing with God here. It's going to be revealed. 
And why get through, you know, in verse 15, why get through life barely escaping the flames, you know, yeah. when you can really build something good and God glorifying, serving and blessing other people. So he says, let's, let's do church well, folks. Let's build well. Yeah, and I think that, that thought of building well then, especially with, with him, you know, as you said, he calls himself the architect, and then he talks someone else building on that foundation. It, I wonder, it, it sounds to me like he has two things in mind. On the one hand, there are other preachers, Apollos being one, and we know that, that there will be other preachers that'll come and cause trouble later in Corinth, especially when we get into 2 Corinthians. So I, I think this thought of, you know, what's being built upon the foundation invites us as hearers to consider what we're hearing from the preachers in our lives and to test what we're hearing. Is it scriptural or not? But then also the way that we build ourselves on that foundation through our time in the Word, through our time in prayer, uh, through you know holding on to the commandments, seeking to do them. Uh, his words here provide opportunity for reflection and repentance as needed on both those counts. Yeah, godly family, godly church, witness to the community. Later in 1 Corinthians, he really digs into the nitty-gritty of, uh, are you really wise? Well, what kind of witness are you giving to the world in the way you conduct yourselves with one another? 1 Corinthians 6. And uh, I don't know if you ever read the book Unchristian by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. Did you ever read that book? Uh, I know I read something by Kinnaman. It might have been that one. It might have been yeah. that one. It's part of the, all the statistics and surveys You know, he does now for Barna as well. Uh, it's the subtitles, What a G New Generation Thinks About Christianity and Why It Matters. And it's very interesting. It was a survey of unchurched young people, 16 to 29 years of age, and they were asked how they would describe the church. And the answers were shocking, I think, to churched people. And maybe Paul would have used those statistics, you know, for the Corinthians as well. But some of the answers were things like judgmental, hypocritical, old-fashioned and sensitive to others, too involved with politics. A lot of negative descriptions from unchurched young people. And we can get upset at those results, but it's very important for us to say, why are people today, why are young people today saying that about the church? And it doesn't take long to look at some of our own failings and shortcomings. Are we building on this beautiful foundation of Christ with political ideologies or political arguments? Are we taking sides in many, many different areas? Are we um, forgetting the grace of God and being harsh toward one another and toward others outside the church? Is the love of Jesus evident in us and through us? And so these words of Paul to the church in Corinth means really are so relevant for us today as well to think carefully about what is being built. Like you said, the truth of those who would proclaim the word and serve, and also the way we steward the beautiful gifts of God. You know, looking at the way that he talks about how these things will be made manifest, he does point us to the last day particularly, when all will be brought to light. But as he talks about that image of fire and things being burned up, I do think that that also invites reflection for the way that suffering and struggle today often serve as the Lord's way of knocking down the things that we've tried to build that haven't really, they're not really good for us, that maybe they need to be knocked down now. And I know, I know you've written a number of things, Pastor Newman, and I think some of those have, have been with struggling and suffering. Can you talk a little bit about the way that sometimes the Lord will start to knock the building down now before the last day and how we ought to receive that sort of discipline from the Lord? Yeah, he disciplines us because he loves us, doesn't he? And that's, you know, it's been said that the one common element we all have in life is suffering. That's what makes us human. And God does use suffering to expose, oh, some of the pathways we're on that aren't healthy and good. You know, we've heard the phrase hitting rock bottom, and that happens so frequently if we're on the wrong path. God uses suffering to refine our thinking, our approach to one another, to soften our hearts and spirits toward one another, to, slave, to slay arrogance and judgmentalism. When we, when we have been through the fire, and I'm glad you brought it up, it's so true, uh, when we've been through the fire, then we can look with compassion upon those who are going through difficult times. 
And they are sifting times for us to look at our priorities. You know, how many times have you been with someone in the hospital? I've been with someone, I've been in a hospital myself for a test or not knowing a diagnosis, wondering what the outcome was going to be. And God used that to say, well, what's really important? How are you showing my love to the people in your life? How are you getting caught up in your own life and worries and missing out on what you really need to do, what you're called to do? So yeah. you're so right. Suffering is a crucible, right? It's the yeah. refining process very That's much. Right. That's right. That's right. So, and, and uh, we'll come all to light on the last day. But Paul is not leaving these Corinthians without hope, not by any means. He's been talking about this thought of a building through verse 15, and then he brings up a specific building, the temple in verse 16. What does he say about God's temple there in 16 and 17? Yeah, I just love it too that the temple theme comes out when he says, you are God's temple, and the God's Spirit dwells in you. And that's not a common phrase in the Scriptures. It's really remarkable. Yeah. Uh, one, again, the, it shows the divinity, the Holy Spirit, the, the oneness, the Trinitarian focus, the beautiful uh, character and nature of God. And uh, that exclamation point when he says in verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. And of course, that comes back again in 1 Corinthians 6, but just uh, another picture and a great contrast again. So here we have all the pagan temples in Corinth, and it's a reference to the naos, the, the sanctuary, the uh, place where God dwells for his people. So uh, pretty amazing comparison again, and it heightens this holiness of the church and the pursuit that Paul is calling the Corinthian Christians to. Yeah, and, and just to notice within this span of five, two verses, he names God five times. God's temple, God's spirit, God's temple, God will destroy, God's temple. So, I mean, we've, we've seen this a couple times in these opening chapters of the letter, where he, I think in the, in the first text, the first nine verses, he names Christ Jesus seven or eight times, you know, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that terminology comes up. So, I mean, hammering home to the Corinthians here, you're talking about Paul, Apollos, Cephas, you belong to God. Keep that in mind. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, a, really, div, a, a, you know, just uh, crushing the divisions, clarifying who they are as one people, and taking away any credence from any other type of temple and God and yeah. spirituality that they may feel pressured by. Yeah, and that's an important point for the church today. Sometimes we, we say that we're not impacted by our culture, but boy, it seeps in to all of us and to the church, whether it is popularity or fame, or we want to be as good as blank or popular as or uh, whatever comparison we do. And I have to believe that in Corinth, the Christians didn't want to feel inferiority. Yeah. They, they wanted to, you know, be just as good as the spirituality next door. And some of that may have been driving some of the arrogance and arguments they were having. And this emphasis on that, ooh, God, over and over again. Yeah, this is who you are. This is who you belong to. And there's there's no one better. Yeah, and I think, I think it, that that perhaps the thought of inferiority very well might have been involved in the church in Corinth, the way that he wrote at the end of chapter one, where he said, remember, you know, when you were called, you weren't powerful, you weren't well known, but but God chooses precisely that. And so I, I think that, that again, dovetails nightly, nicely into where he's headed in, in this chapter, as he says, you know, don't deceive yourself. You want to be wise in this world? Don't don't go for it. Be fools in this age. Be wise in Christ. He comes back to that theme of what what is wisdom, what is foolishness. Help us into verses eighteen and following. Yeah, it's it's so good. I have to believe too, for some of the people with Jewish background, when he mentioned temple destruction, that had to give them a few shivers as well. Like, wait a minute, this has happened before, uh, in terms of unfaithfulness. That those little phrases just bring a huge rush of Old Testament history. God's calling to his people to be a light to the nations, uh, the blessings and curses, what God will definitely do. So there's some real authoritative language in there as well as he brings up the temple. Yeah. 
And then, of course, he, he goes into this wise and foolishness talk again. And I just love, I think what stood out for me are these quotes. You know, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he's wise in this age, let him become a fool. So he's hearkening back to his talk earlier in the first couple of chapters. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. And then he quotes Job 5.13. He catches the wise in their craftiness. Now, that just, to me, is a stroke of genius and pretty amazing, even as we read it. Uh, Job is only quoted by Paul, what, a couple of times, I think, in the Scriptures? Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to do my research there. But in yeah. Job chapter 5, that's, that's not top on the must-read list of the Old Testament, usually, for Christians today, at least. Definitely not. He brings this most ancient book, this wisdom literature, this theodicy, and in Job 5, that was the first of Job's friends, Eliphaz, who started lecturing Job on what was really going on. But the speech was all about wisdom and foolishness. It's as if Paul is saying, listen, if you think you know what's best currently, let me take you all the way back to the ancient enduring wisdom of God, and here's Here's the foundational word on it, and he quotes Job about, uh, you know, your wisdom won't measure up. I, that's just, that's a beautiful uh, use of the Holy Scriptures. Absolutely, and just thinking about the way he's talked about wisdom in chapter 1, the wisdom of men, that doesn't, that doesn't have anything on the so-called foolishness of God. So God in his foolishness is still going to catch you. If you think, you think, you think your wisdom is going to do it for you, it's not. So he takes us back to Job there with one quotation. What's the, the next quotation? Well, the next quotation is another just beautiful one from Psalm 94, 94, 11. And he says, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Now, what I love about the Psalms, you know, Jesus does this too. And for the Jewish reader, when you bring up part of the Psalm, the whole Psalm echoes with it. And so we have the beautiful, uh, you know, in addition to this indictment against the thoughts of their wisdom, we have Paul, I think, kind of counterbalancing the Job verse, actually. Hmm. Because in, in Job, we see just God speaking, his pinky finger <laughs> puts us all to shame. But in Psalm 94, uh, following that little section there, verse 11, we hear verses like this, blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord. So there's the discipline you mentioned before, and whom you teach uh, out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble. There's some comfort coming in here. He says, guys, I'm going to let you know that your wisdom is nothing. But as you look to the Lord, instead of being crushed by his power, his might, his authority, uh, verses 14 and 15 in Psalm 94 say, For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and the upright in heart will follow it. There's some shepherding going on there. And then one of my favorites from Psalm 94, and I quote this out of the NIV because it brings up anxiety, but this troubled church, this church being tossed about, and actually the Greek word for anxiety uh, in Matthew 6 and used elsewhere in the Scripture is this, this being tossed about like a boat on the sea. And uh, Psalm 94, 17 and 19 say, Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, My foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. And I just have to believe that Paul is saying, listen, guys, there's a soft landing here in the wisdom and grace of God. Let's go there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's something better than your boasting. It's not only the rebuke of the sin that's there, but also a call to rest in the gifts that God has for his people. So then he, he comes to this conclusion, verse 21, let no one boast in men, rather, what's the, so take a second, verse 21, don't boast in men, but rather all things are yours, including these preachers, and, and hey, you belong to Christ, and, and Christ is God. Help us into the, the conclusion of this chapter. Yeah, I love this. It reminds me of what Paul says in Romans, in Romans 8, that, you know, if God has given us his Son, will he not, along with him, give us all things? He's saying, there is this wealth, this blessing of all things from God your Savior. Don't settle for less. You don't need to boast in yourself. Our self-justification is narrow and flawed. What we fight about and argue about 
causes divisions and doesn't reflect the glory, the goodness, the grace of God in His kingdom. And we've, we're given all we need in Christ. And it reminds me of Article 4, the Augsburg Confession again. It's, it's as if Paul just goes right to that which our confession stands or falls upon, that we are justified by grace alone through the atoning sacrifice of Christ for us. It is all Him. We are dead in our sins, but made alive with Christ. And He just lifts the people up to that better place of God's grace. Mm. Got about a minute and a half here, President Newman. As you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the way Paul spoke to this church in Corinth, even in its midst of troubled times. Uh, what's the, the word that Paul has for us as Christians in 2023? You know, what, some questions come to mind, you know, just to get our thoughts going. It's easy to read these things and walk away and say, oh, that was nice, but how are we called to become fools for Christ? And what do we need to let go of? How do we need to stop being pulled into the narrative, not only of the world, but even of our own preferences and arguments, to let go of those things so that God can be glorified, so the unity of the church can be seen, so the love of Christ can prevail. You know, Paul, when he uses the word you in here, he's, you're, you're his temple, etc. It's plural. So he's talking about the community of the church. And I think for each of us, again, to start with repentance as the first thesis of the 95 Theses say, and say, you know, what do I need to let go of? How am I being stubborn toward my wife or kids or in my church? Uh, how am I being biased or judgmental to the culture instead of saying, wait a minute, how does the gospel fit? So Paul calls us off our high horse and he says, let's be servants of our Lord Jesus and proclaim his name. Amen. Pastor Mike Newman is president of the Texas District of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. He's been helping us today to study 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. Pastor Newman, thanks for being our guest today. It's a joy to be with you, Pastor. Thank you. What am I? Uh, what are you? Servants. Servants of the Lord. The one who assigns to us, who gives to us according to his will and purposes. The one who gives the growth. God grant that we would be faithful servants, planting, watering, receiving the growth in his time according to his will that what we continue to build might be on this one foundation, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for us. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.